Hi, uh, I've seen a couple of faces that I recognise already. So some of you might know me already. Um, I'm Martin. I work for 361 Community Energy. We're based in Barnstable in North Devon. It's the main um, work for 361 is on the domestic side. So we do a lot of domestic uh, support for families in fuel poverty. I joined 361 three years ago to help develop the commercial side. So I work with public sector and commercial and business doing a very similar thing, how we can improve efficiencies, reduce running costs, reduce carbon, and help uh, set up a strategy for the next five to eight years. Great, thank you. And Paul, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Paul Gilbert, the business I work for is the Southwest Manufacturing Advisory Service. Um, we basically design and develop a, a whole series of um, support programs. Um, one of the most recent ones that we are now delivering is a net zero program that isn't just for manufacturers, it's for any business um, basically in the southwest. So we're really um, pleased to be working with Beth and Chris um, with Low Carbon Devon. Um, and that we're currently, we've got a funded program through Plymouth City Council as well. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking to you a bit later about net zero and uh, carbon footprinting in a, in a sort of quick overview. Perfect, thank you. Um, so yeah, and having introduced ourselves, if you'd like to kind of put your name and maybe organisation into the chat, that'd be really useful because actually obviously we're kind of, particularly in the in-person sessions, going to be working together a bit more. So it's just nice for everyone else to know who's here um, and where, what kind of background you're from because it, it, there is a real range of um, organisations here doing lots of different things. So it's going to be very interesting to look at how kind of our carbon emissions and the way we calculate it would well would differ between um, all of those. So if you'd like to put that in, that would be great. I might just open the chat. Yeah, so as you can see, there's a real range of kind of organisations doing quite different things. Um, so it'll be really interesting to kind of see when we come together and calculate our emissions, actually where those emissions are coming from and how that's going to differ um, on everyone like from every business and organisation based on um, what we do. Um, I'll just give another minute in case anyone hasn't put those yet. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's quite nice just to put things like that so it's not just talking at screen or you're kind of being involved with everyone else who is here. Um, right, so um, I think Martin will go into this in a bit more detail as well as Paul. Um, but obviously it's really important. It's a really important time to be measuring our missions. Um, and it's really great that there's so many people here that obviously that you're wanting to and engaging in that. Um, and so, so hopefully we can help you Kind of get to that stage of measuring your emissions working out how we can reduce it um, and kind of get you started on that journey or furthering it depending where you already are over these kind of sessions over the next few weeks um, because obviously i'm quite aware that actually measuring your carbon footprint can be quite daunting um, because there's lots of kind of terminology and lots of information out there and it's quite hard to know where to start um, let alone what's the net, the best process to go by. So hopefully this will kind of help clear a lot of that up for you. And yeah, you'll be able to come out of this with a carbon footprint that you can help use to kind of, yeah, decide where you're going to put investment into to reduce your emissions, where the focus might need to be, um, and hopefully kind of move forward on that journey. Um, this is the first of four workshops or events in this series. Um, so today we're just going to do a bit of scene setting um, talk about why it's important. We'll discuss some of the terminology and just kind of break some of that down for you. Um, and then we'll kind of mention 
yeah, kind of declarations and um, that can, yeah, you can use to support um, this work. And then next session, which will be in person on the 19th, um, we're going to go actually in through the process of measuring your carbon emissions. We'll talk it through step by step, and then you'll have the opportunity to calculate that yourself. The following session on the 29th, um, that's again in person, but we're going to look a bit more at scope three emissions, kind of what that is, the challenges involved in measuring them, and then also discuss kind of carbon offsetting and some of the other methods, um, that obviously often discussed, but it's important to kind of understand what they are and how you can use them. And then the final session, which is on the 16th of June, um, we're kind of going to invite a number of carbon consultancies and specialists who you can kind of speak to um, and see whether you may want to kind of use them and get help from them to kind of keep going forward on your journey. So hopefully it means that by the end of this, you'll have quite a clear idea of where your focus needs to be, um, the support that's available, and then kind of help you move forward on a journey to reducing emissions and reducing kind of overall environmental impacts. Um, I'm going to pass on to Martin now, who's going to give you a bit more about kind of why we're here and why it's important. Um, I have some slides for that, so I'll share those now. Thanks, Beth. Uh, so this, this, there's only a few slides on this. This is really just a very brief taster session of the workshop that's going to be on the 19th. So Beth, if you could flick to the next slide for me, Beth, please. So we're going to go into a lot more detail in the in the actual workshop, but these, as I say, is just a taster. So what I want you to all to think about initially in this, this session, all session, the question and answer sessions and the live workshops, that there's, there isn't anything that's the wrong answer. We're not here to embarrass you, catch you out, point fingers, say why you're doing that. This is every carbon footprint is totally unique. So although there's comparisons you can do within industries, we're not looking at about and embarrassing anybody. This is purely the, the more open you can be about your carbon footprint, uh, the better really, and how we, the more, uh, in effect, the worse it is, the more impact we can have on improving it. So don't feel uh, embarrassed or ashamed about admitting or anything that you declare in your carbon footprint. Also, don't, uh, I know a certain generation had a reputation of clearly cleaning up before the cleaner arrived. And, and again, it's that same principle. What we want you to do is not make a big imprint, you know, change to your carbon footprint. Don't spend a, a big investment on retrofitting before you've actually established your carbon footprint. Don't clean up before we've actually established how or what your carbon footprint kind of looks like. Uh, and so this will be completely confidential and it's only information we're going to be sharing directly with you and potentially your utility providers with the information that you can access from them. Beth, can you flick to the next one for me, please? So we're going to get, again go through this in a lot more detail in the actual workshop. The only two steps of this roadmap is really what I want to look at is the first two. So your utility management, setting your baseline and monitoring your energy uh, management. What we really want to look at is doing that in you know, almost like a scale mode with nobody else in the organization or business knows about it, just the finance team. We want to establish how and where your energy is being used. And scope one is basically fuels that you burn on site. So gas, oil, LPG, petrol, diesel, anything like that, any combustible fuel that you use, that's what we want to monitor, understand how much and where that's being used before we go into any other kind of stages. And this sequence, having done this for seven years across a number of manufacturing sectors, schools, sports and leisure centres, hospitals, care homes, churches, they tend to be the most inefficient users of energy uh, for you know, all relative kind of reasons. But the sequence of improving their carbon footprint in as much as a cash positive quick win roadmap as possible is this one. So it's very basic, it's very simple, stage one. What we don't want to do is go straight into the green box and start investing in a retrofit energy efficiency system, even if it's LED lighted, because the unfortunate thing is the companies that have helped support, we've gone to them and said, great, how much of an impact did that investment 
uh, impact your business? How much did it save? How much carbon did it save? What was your return on investment? And they look with blank faces, very embarrassing, and say, I don't know, because we don't know where we started from. So without having doing that base homework of establishing your baseline and your monitoring and doing the other much quicker win, easy behavioral changes, setting thermostats, timers, really quick, simple uh, changes, you can get to the green box pretty much by saving up to between 30 and 45% of your utility bill just by doing those in a relatively cash-free way before you actually spend a single penny on a retrofit uh, equipment. So that would be the plan. I'll be going through that in more detail in the workshop uh, as well. But why are we doing it? Beth, can you flick to the next one for me, please? Why is carbon footprinting important? Is actually this. We all know now the government have set a climate emergency at 2050. The United Nations have been setting targets at 2030 uh, with the sustainable development goals. So one of the ways of looking at this as being part of the kind of privileged, spoiled, developed world, the globe, the global demand on natural resources has got to a level where it is outstripping the speed the earth can regenerate them. This map I found absolutely mind-blowingly uh, great illustration is if you look at our position on that global map, if the whole world, the whole globe, every country on the planet used resources at the same rate as the UK, those resources for that year would run out on the 19th of May. Fortunately, not every country does use it at the same rate as us, but that, as you can see, the fact that we would run out this month, our whole year's natural resources, that's the other thing we're going to be doing in the workshop on my section, is not just looking at your carbon footprint, but every natural resource your organisation uses. And you can see, like, Ecuador is pretty much, as a developing country, got about the right balance of demand and resource uh, replenishment. So you can see how important it is that we need to now look at the way we manage resources, how we use resources, can we reduce our demand, can we reuse our demand, can we uh, recycle, can we repurpose, can we actually generate on-site, off-grid, renewable, clean energy to impact those, those figures. And as I say, for the UK, this is going to be a mammoth task to do. Beth, we might flick into the next one for me, please. How are we going to do that? I use the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals, great way of initiating and engaging staff and understanding that being global citizens, how important it is to look at every resource your organisation uses, how they can impact your business, and how you can be more efficient, more productive, more socially uh, minded in your community and the economy without actually affecting the planet. And if I think I'm going to flick to the next slide. i leave it there to leave it to, to Paul to talk to you about how his uh, organization helps. How's that? Um, thank you, Martin. Yeah. Um, so just really building on um, what Martin um, was, was saying, I'm going to be talking about, if I can get the slides to share, be talking a little bit more in depth about um, carbon footprinting. Um, and basically what Beth has asked me to do is, is cover off two things really in, in just under 10 minutes, which look quite simple, there's two little lines on a screen, but um, it's quite a bit of content. So I'm going to talk really about what net zero means, what, what does that mean to us, and then just build on what Martin was saying, and then take you through a little bit more detail about carbon footprinting, so that then we're all ready to rock and roll at the next session where we're actually going to be doing our own carbon footprints for the businesses. So as I said, we're running our own net zero program. We've helped about 100 businesses so far since we launched in August last year. You'll be hearing from one of them um, slightly later on after me, um, Karen Friendship from Alderman Tooling. And I see we've got another business that we've helped um, on the delegate list today. So 
Really want to start on what does net zero mean? There's a lot of talk about it. Um, it comes from the um, sort of the, the you've all heard of COP26 in Glasgow. So it was the conference of parties um, met back in 2015. And that was the first time ever that the world got together and decided, yeah, we need to do something. Martin's just talked about the sort of resource pressure on the on the planet. This was around, we need to do something about climate change and to stop climate change getting out of control. It was sort of widely agreed that one and a half degrees rise was where we need to stop it. Um, to achieve one and a half degrees rise or less means we have to go to net zero, um, which in, in those days was 2050, but more commonly 2030 is becoming the, the standard sort of year to achieve it. The COPs meet every five years, and this we, did, we just had the one in um, Glasgow, and they'll be meeting in Egypt, I believe, next. So that's what set net zero. In terms of what it actually means, just think of it as a set of wave scales. So whatever your business or your personal footprint is, whatever carbon emissions you're putting out into the atmosphere, you can achieve net zero by making sure that basically whatever you take away, either through an offset scheme or something similar, um, is no more than you actually put out. So you're looking at this balance. Um, some people call it um, a sort of carbon budget. So it's, 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 it's working out sort of when you reach that zero. Um, and then you'll hear other terms about going carbon positive, carbon negative, but it's all about this, this balance of, of picking out no more than we can actually take away by the planet. Um, if you want to look at that graphically, um, there's some really good um, playbooks and everything from the Exponential Roadmap team and the links on the uh, next slide. This is what net zero looks like graphically when you look at the sources of emissions globally, you've got energy, industry, buildings, transport, food, and then underneath you've got these what's called nature-based sinks. So that's where the planet is able to actually absorb carbon itself. So we get to net zero when we get that balance. Um, quite scary, it means a 50% reduction every 10 years if we're going to achieve it by 2050. If we accelerate that to 2030, it is, is a heck of a um, challenge. But we were talking this morning on, a, we were doing some carbon literacy training, and we were talking about the challenge of the ozone, the hole in the ozone layer in the 80s, 90s. It, 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 it galvanized the world to get together and they fixed that in, in several years. Climate change is a bit more challenging because of the variables, but it can be done. In terms of your business, the good news is that first 50% saving is the easiest to do and it was where you're going to get your big um, commercial benefits. Um, as I said, this exponential um, playbook that we use a lot of, it sets out your journey of net zero in four steps. So reduce your own emissions, then start tackling your supply chain, as we've just heard, leave that till, till a little bit downstream, then really integrate it into your strategy and business, and then use what you're doing to actually influence others. So we'll be hearing from Karen later on, and she's using her experience to hopefully um, in, influence and motivate um, some of the others that we've got on the, on the call this afternoon. So in terms of reducing your own emissions, it's really doing this, getting this benchmark um, that's what we're talking. Um, that's what we've got to do is try and figure out in our own business what actually are our emissions. Um, so we do that by basically um, gathering a carbon footprint. Um, the reason we do that is basically you can't, you can't manage what you don't measure. So you need this, this line in the sand for your business. And what we know is data, gathering data enables you to make business decisions. And they're based on fact rather than, than gut feel. Um, larger companies are already mandated to footprint, and I'm sure the government is going to flow that down to smaller companies as we go. So very quickly, how do we do a carbon footprint? Um, you need to get started and just understand some of the terminology. We'll be building on this at the next workshop, but basically there's two types of footprint. You can choose to do a company one or you can do a product. These workshops are going to focus on the left-hand side. And we're going to be looking at your own business um, carbon footprint. So once you've decided that, you then need to think about these things called scopes and how we, how we measure carbon within our business. So the globally sort of recognized standard is the GHG protocol. That splits your emissions into three scopes, and Martin's already touched on, on some of these. Scope one, basically things that you burn on site or in company controlled equipment. So um, that's your gas boiler, your cars, um, for some it might be boats. So they're all under your direct control. 
and it's um, from basically burning um, fuels on site. Scope two is where you're having indirect emissions, but for things that are under your influence. So that's pretty much for everybody on the call would be just electricity, um, unless you are a business that, that imports heating and cooling. Scope three is the big one. Um, that's sort of the elephant in the room, really. That's the, the one where the, the complexity begins. But the good news is, if you're starting this journey, my suggestion, and I'm sure Martin would agree, is just keep to the simple ones, scope one and scope two, get your own house in order, and then you can start looking at scope three once you're, once you're comfortable. So you're going to be doing this um, prior to the next session. We're going to be gathering some data. So you're going to be um, looking for mileage data. You're going to be looking for mileage data, looking for energy bills, looking for, for data, and we'll, we'll give you some tools to, to make this very easy. Once you've got that data, you then need to calculate it somehow. There's a whole range of options. Um, again, the, the GHG site, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol site, has got a very detailed calculator, probably too, too detailed. Um, but the good news is that we've um, created our own calculator for net zero programs. So we're going to be using that with, with you next uh, the next session so that you can directly input your data and get your carbon footprint within that next session. <clears throat> Um, be careful with the jargon. Uh, there's two terms that are quite often used and interchanged, but they are subtly different. Um, so net zero, you can only achieve net zero if you do um, net zero within all three scopes. So you, to get to true net zero, you're going to have to deal with the supply chain. But you probably just want to start thinking about becoming a carbon neutral business, which is when you're looking at scopes one and two under your own activities. Um, what this whole workshop series is about, though, isn't just plugging some data in and getting a number. We want you to use this information to drive change in your business um, and to make some savings, both for the environment, but also commercially. So what I would be doing is once you've got your footprint, start to analyze it, start to figure out where's the lion's share of your emissions coming from. Is it energy? Is it mileage? I did one for a client yesterday. 71% of their footprint is through their forklift truck because it runs up and down the, the industrial estate so they're not going to be worried about energy because energy was for them as less than six percent of their footprint but they are going to be looking at the forklift truck and, and swapping it onto um, a biofuel so that they can reduce the emissions once you've really analyzed your footprint it's about building a plan and these workshops will help develop and build that plan as we go um, but as martin said it's about regular energy management, regular reviews. Don't just do it once and leave it on the shelf. This is about you going back and revisiting it um, every sort of two or three months. Good news is help is available. There's obviously these workshops we'll be taking you through, but there's also the Net Zero program that Swimmers are delivering. I won't go into any details. It's, it's all on the website for those that are interested. Um, but it's basically there. It's funded support through these workshops and our Net Zero program to help you and hold your hand on this journey. We're going to take questions, I think, at the end, Beth. So I will um, hand over to Karen Friendship from Alderman Tooling now. Great, thank you, Paul. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, have you got my slide available or do you want me to share my screen? If you can share, Karen, probably. Yeah, okay, it's all right. Let me, set, let me set it up for you. So welcome everybody. Um, so we've been working with Swimass uh, for many, many years. We go back a long way, don't we, Paul? Um, but obviously when this program came up, actually uh, we jumped at the chance to, um, uh, to get engaged. Um, so we um, started our journey, our baseline year, which we started um, actually the year of COVID, which obviously is not helpful at all. Um, but um, sorry, let me see if I can find my screen. I'm just losing trying to get too many things in place here. It's not, doesn't seem to be letting me guys. Um, we can see it, Karen. Oh, can you? Yeah, you just okay. might want to put it into full yeah. screen mode. That's fine. Great, thanks Paul. Um, so we began our journey. Um, so we, we aligned it with our financial year, um, which was June, 2021. Um, Sorry, 20, 
June 2020 to, to May 2021. So actually that was right on top of uh, the COVID year. We had a generally okay year. It was a, it was a flat year from the year before, but um, we knew that actually this was a good time to start. Um, so we set, set the baseline. We didn't know what was going to be the output at all. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that we had some had a goal. So um, I'm big on data. I'm an engineer through and through. Um, and Alderman's are a sheet metal fabricator in Plymouth. So we actually use a hell of a lot of energy. Um, I've got 50 people here working on sites um, and the machines whirring around. We've got two compressors on the go all the time. We have a late shift that, that operates as well. Um, so we're always on the go. Um, so you can you can hear the energy oozing from every corner of the business. So I knew that energy was going to be our biggest biggest concern. Um, but the the certainly the the dashboard that um, Swimmers has helped us set up has allowed us to measure it. So we are mostly measuring um, all our utility bills. So our, anything that we're generating from water, from steam, electricity, uh, gas, um, and basically, as you can see from the from our dashboard here. Oh, sorry, I just can I just stop the show. No. So that's gone. Bear with me. Um, yeah, uh, is um, about ninety percent of what uh, our carbon is saying is that it's come from our electricity contracts. Um, so that was a at least a good place to start looking. Um, and what gets measured gets changed in our business. So we have measures for everything: KPIs, charts everywhere, all over the shop floor. So what gets measured gets changed. Um, so interpreting the data was interesting, and actually it it, it flagged up a couple of little interesting um, dilemmas. You know, we were using four times as much gas in the winter months and the, the date the, the, in the summer months. So we started now to look at our heating system because obviously we have shutter doors that go up and down all the time. So actually we're obviously clearly losing a lot during the winter months. Um, but also um, it was about education for us, why we're doing it. Um, now, um, probably like you, you're all seeing your energy bills going up. Um, so if it's not, if that's not the, the sole driver, then I don't know what would be. Um, I'm just coming out of an electricity contract in the autumn. Um, and I'll happily share with you, we pay about £90,000 a year for our electricity. I've just had some quotes and our estimated bill for our next financial year would be £250,000. So that's gone up 160%. Now, if that's not motivation to try and um, reduce your energy and reduce your carbon footprint, I don't know what is. But aside from that, um, you know, we've got a limited window to try and get it down as much as possible to uh, reuse um, or not use electricity and save um, on our machinery, turn things off. So it, a lot of it is to do with behavior and communication. So that's where we're starting. Um, but also it's the right thing to do in the business. You know, it, it highlights as a business that you, you're, you're caring and actually you're, you're, you can market yourselves as a forward thinking, ambitious business. No doubt if you've got bigger uh, tier one, tier two suppliers or sorry, customers, they're going to be asking these questions because you are part of a scope three in a minute because you're their supply chain. They're going to be asking you what your carbon footprint is in a minute. So I wanted to just get ahead, um, which is exactly why, what we're doing now. We're appointing the middle of appointing um, net zero champions on the shop floor. So actually getting um, buy in from every corner of the business. You know, it, this this whilst this has to be um, uh, leadership led, it does need to be implemented uh, from the from the grassroots up. But some certain things that we've done already in the business, which has been great for us, um, we've installed EV charging points, um, we've insulated our roof, um, we've actually bought a company e-bike. So this is actually possibly on the scope three area, but trying to encourage our guys to use our company e-bike to see what it would be like to um, cycle into work before they obviously commit to buying a, uh, an electric bike for a couple hundred thousand pounds, because um, they are quite expensive at the moment. But they've got one on hand here that they can try before they buy. Um, and obviously it, it does do a couple of little trips in between as well. We've also applied for the CCL levy exemption. This is the climate change levy exemption. Um, because we're in metal processing, um, we can go back and have a review of our last four years bills to actually try and claim some money back because obviously we're in an industry which obviously consumes a lot of energy. So we've already applied for that, which is great. So we do have some money coming back um, when HMRC can pull their finger out. Um, we're looking at um, uh, lighting as well. So we're halfway through the process of installing LEDs on the shop floor. It's taken a while because obviously we've got very, you know, six meter high um, lighting um, in various parts of the factory. So that's underway. Um, but I've also had a quote for additional solar panels. So we've got about a fifth of our roof already covered in solar panels. And actually they were the, that was the corner of the factory that the, the pitch and the angle and the direction of the, uh, the roof was the right 
uh, right area. But now efficiency of panels are getting much better. We're looking at actually covering it. You know, it's an asset out there. It's not doing anything. No one can see it. So why not use it? Um, but our original, our, our first quote that we've actually received is £230,000. So obviously, you know, you've got to make sure that the payback's right. Um, that's estimated at the moment to be a payback of about four years at these higher tariff rates. So we're seriously contemplating that at the moment, but obviously we need to find the, uh, for the capital to do that. Um, and obviously one of the last things that we will be looking at is obviously changing to a green energy supplier. Um, so yeah, whilst um, prices are very um, uh, increasing greatly at the moment, um, a green energy supply will obviously no doubt have a small premium on top of that as well, um, but it will be the last thing that we do. And then obviously looking at our scope three, which is our steel usage um, and looking at the, the rest of the supply chain. So that's that's us. I mean, I would um, absolutely recommend um, the, the carbon dashboard. Just start measuring, get your baseline. And in even if you don't do anything for another year, you know, at least, you know, you know what it is you're measuring against um, and then having a bit of a target. So. We aim to get to net zero by 2040. No doubt, you know, we'll try and get there much sooner. And actually these um, higher energy bills is just going to be our motivation to get there even quicker than that. Um, but there's lots of things you can do in getting your whole team involved. So that's what we're doing at Odelman's. I hope that, um, that helps inspire you to, to go on and start measuring. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Karen. So happy to take questions. if. Anyone has any? Or I don't know whether you're waiting till the very end, Paul. Um, no, I was going to say, yeah, maybe now might be a good chance if anyone has any questions around kind of carbon footprinting, that process, anything Paul, Martin or Karen's mentioned, now might be a good time to kind of ask those questions and we can address some of them before we kind of round off um, a bit more. Because there's, there's a lot of content, obviously, we've filled into quite a short amount of time there. And some of it we will obviously go into more detail in the next sessions, but it's really useful, particularly and yeah, when Karen's here to kind of give some experience. If you have any questions, um, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Or you can unmute yourself um, if you'd like to do that option as well. Hi, I've got a quick question. Um, Larry Cole here from CSW Group. Uh, we have um, about 150 employees in our company across Cornwall and Devon um, but nearly all of our employees work from home uh, and go out into other people's places to work like schools for example how how is it how is it is there is there a technique to measure our fuel use because we don't really we have a head office in Plymouth which is but I mean you know only a fraction of the people actually use that and um, we've got a very small office in Exeter as well, which is just almost like a kind of an admin base for, for, for filing cabinets. But apart from that, everybody else works from home. And I was just wondering, trying to think, how do we measure the fuel use, et cetera, et cetera? Is that, I'm hoping it's possible, but... <laughs> yeah. Do you, happy to, for me to pick that up? Or do you want to jump in, Martin? I, I was just going to say the... the as you. Uh, Larry, as you said, the, the building side of it, the built environment carbon footprint is the easy part. And, and as Paul has said, I tend to get involved with the scope one and two because they're relatively easy. Uh, it's not that bit's not confusing, but it's actually very straightforward. There's some great free information and calculators out there, as Paul said. But I think I'm going to tag this over to Paul because you, you do you've done more work around scope three than you, Paul. So this is really falls into that category because there it's carbon implications in in the running of your business rather than the direct uh built environment kind of carbon footprint so am i right to tag that to you paul okay. that's fine that's fine mine yeah um yeah really good question uh we had the same sort of dilemma larry um we're predominantly home-based but we flipped to a 100 percent home-based model um through covid so there's a couple of things i can put in the chat there's a really good white paper that was produced with some credible scientific data around the typical carbon footprint associated with home working. So you can start to then accrue carbon emissions from your home working um, setup. How do your employees claim for their business miles? Yeah, so we've got we've got a a system for claiming business miles. Some some are kind of some are able to claim for every everything they do 
for work based and some have to kind of commute to their place of work which is someone else's buildings or, or whatever yeah. you said i mean but we use the standard hmrc mileage claim process and we've got a, a, a you know an electronic kind of claim software whatever okay so you should be able to quickly account for the number of business miles that are being driven yes, by your definitely. team so yeah so that's that data is readily available your next decision really then is how complex you want to do it there's conversion factors for your average car there's a conversion yep. factor for a, a large diesel a small diesel a medium diesel right. and, a, and a large small or medium petrol we chose initially to do it by registration so each employee you get the registration you can go on the government website and you can get the actual emissions data for that vehicle we went into all that detail and then we just cross checked it with the recognized emission for an average car and it was within five or ten percent right so save yourself a lot of trouble probably just yeah. <laughs> do it as an average car and i'm happy yeah. to share those details and perfect that detail yeah. will be in the tool anyway that would be great thank you thank you it was just hard to kind of see how it might work but obviously there's a lot of people in our situation at the moment um like you say particularly since covid so yeah that's great to know thank you does anyone else have any other questions they'd like to ask at this point I'm going to check the chat but it looks like okay in which case I was um, just going to mention a couple of kind of things you can do in terms of declaring a climate emergency and kind of some other things you can kind of sign up to as a way of um, what's the word it's just gone from my head um, but yeah, kind of raising awareness of what you're doing um, and get and kind of gaining some of those other benefits. Um, I'll just share this. Um, okay, so as kind of Paul and Martin also kind of touched upon, obviously there. There are lots of benefits to gain from reducing your emissions, whether that's kind of your energy bills and cost savings that you generate yourself. Um, but there's also a lot of pressure coming from kind of your customers, your employees, other businesses you work from. Um, there's a wide range of kind of your stakeholders who kind of want to see that you're taking action on the climate and think that's really important. And in order to kind of show that you're doing that and make sure you're doing it kind of in an accredited, accredited way where possible, there are kind of a few things you can join and sign up to, um, yeah, to show what you're doing and actually kind of put some, yeah, I guess some kind of the, yeah, I guess prove what you're doing to an extent and actually make sure there's kind of the accredited kind of platform behind you um, so that everyone actually kind of takes on that benefit and you kind of hopefully can show your employees, your customers, actually kind of the impact you're having and the actual action that you are taking. Um, so the Race to Zero or Net Zero is a UN-backed campaign um, for all non-state actors. So it can be organisations, businesses, I think even cities and kind of regions can commit to this. And it's the idea of halving your emissions by 2030. Um, so that's kind of a global campaign. And you kind of can take part in that by joining a number of partners, such as Business Declares, or the SME Climate Hub. And through joining these, you become part of that wider Race to Zero um, platform. So the Business Declares, for example, is a network um, it's designed, it's designed to help raise awareness um, of climate change and biodiversity loss. And I think social injustice is part of that. But it's all about kind of celebrating the businesses that are declaring an, an emergency um, and actually using that to help generate um, change. So the Business Declares Network, I think to join that, you have to kind of like measure or ideally measure your emissions or your scope two and one, scope one and two emissions and set a target to reduce or half those by 2030. Um, they also require you to at least consider or discuss your scope three emissions. Um, there isn't a need to necessarily have done that or reduce them, but it's just kind of being aware of them and taking that within consideration of how your business works. Um, 
And then the SME Climate Hub, that's kind of very similar. And it's, again, another business network that kind of helps to achieve it and kind of give you some accreditation for committing to these um, these targets. And to join the SME Climate Hub, you have to commit, again, to halving your emissions by 2030 and then achieving net zero by 2050. So there is some, I think there's a slight differentiation between the two in terms of when maybe you're going to commit to one of those. Um, but by joining these and like declaring um, that there is a carbon emergency and that you're going to take action on it, um, it just allows kind of engagement within within these themselves. Both their website have good kind of a good access to resources. Um, it allows you to be part of a network where other businesses are taking part in it. And it also yeah, and it allows you to kind of use these platforms to promote what you're doing. Um, but it's a good way of being held kind of accountable to the targets that you're doing or you've set and the action that you're taking and kind of doing that in a recognised way that means that you're not just saying that you're taking action. Um, people can see these and will recognise them as kind of a certain standard and you can kind of prove to whoever it might be that's asking um, that you are taking action and moving forward. I think... Um, yeah, it kind of demonstrates that you've kind of taken some leadership on it of this. You're, it's a good way of engaging people within the action you're taking. Um, and they're a good way of kind of prompting yourself to stay ahead of potential regulation that's likely to become in the future. Obviously, there are, as Paul mentioned, some businesses that already legally have to report their carbon emissions. And increasingly, that's probably going to become increasingly likely um, as we go forward. But by using these as kind of a guide and using their resources, um, that's a good way to do that. And so I was just going to quickly discuss what it means to kind of declare a climate emergency and the steps behind that, because there, there are different ways that you can do that. It's very kind of dependent on your business. Um, but it's, it's a really good way, ideally, of engaging kind of some stakeholder support so they can become engaged. Um, so essentially, declaring a climate emergency is quite simple. You can just put it on, on a website, on a social media post just sort of to make it acknowledge that you have committed or declared that. Um, but it's really important that, as Karen mentioned, actually, that it goes the whole way through your business. So you need kind of board level agreement um, with it, but then also to engage your employees and make sure that they're involved in the process of kind of decarbonisation. Um, and it's important that you can obviously make a declaration to say you're going to reduce your carbon emissions, but it's really important that that comes with a plan, which is where this workshops will come in. We will kind of go further into that. But actually, it's important that we don't just measure our emissions and know that, but we then look at it and kind of begin to develop a plan going forward. Um, and that's kind of where these can come in again, um, just to kind of give you some, yeah, recognition and kind of acknowledge that what the steps you're taking um, are really worthwhile and potentially hope well hopefully going to make a big impact not only on your business but on the wider um, environment and carbon emissions of of, of ev well, where we live but also the wider um, globe and essentially you have become part of kind of a network it's not necessarily just local but a global thing um, I was just going to show you a couple of businesses who have made a, uh, a declaration on their website they're very simple uh, that's my mouse gone so this is Greenheart Consulting. So they're based just outside of Plymouth. Um, and there is very little, well, there is very little in there in terms of data, in terms of you having to evidence. It's simply kind of setting out why they think it's important to take action on climate. And then they've put a target in there. Um, they've committed to lower their impacts and be like net carbon neutral by 2030 or before. So it is. it doesn't take long to put together a climate declaration but it's important that there's the work behind it I think that's probably what the, is the most important bit that comes from this is that they're very simple to put out and put at a put together and kind of publish but it's really important that we back it up with a plan going forward um, which yeah we all talk through that and further and then I've just got another one here which is Nash & Co which is solicitors in Plymouth um, and they've committed they're both both part of the business declares network um, so 
again, very simple, and they've just set out that they commit to be um, carbon neutral by 2023. Um, I think, again, a bit like Martin mentioned, it's important not to, a lot of businesses have their, there are different dates that people are going for, um, and it will depend where you are on that journey, at what point you might achieve it, and not to feel kind of, I guess, pressured or, um, obviously, the earlier we achieve it, the better, but it's important to be realistic um, about when you're setting these goals. So don't set something that you're never going to achieve. Um, it's kind of working there. But that's something that we'll go through again. Once we've measured the emissions, we can see where the where the work needs to be. And that might impact at what point you can reach them. So that's something we'll go through in further detail. Um, I'll stop doing that. OK, um, let me just check the chat. And I was just going to see, is there anything has anyone, well, firstly, has anyone made a climate declaration? I was just interested to know where people kind of are on this. Has anyone tried to measure their carbon emissions and hasn't got very far? Or is everyone at the point where so far haven't measured their emissions yet? And this is kind of the beginning of that, that journey for them. Shall we? Uh, Ten years ago, I was working with a lot of companies that had produced uh, an environment report at that, at that point. Uh, and when you go and say, oh, can I see your environment report? Yeah, it's in that filing cabinet over there. Did it nine years ago. And that's where it sat. They've not reviewed it, not updated it, not actually monitored it. Uh, what, what I'd love these declarations to be is actually about declaring what your target is and what your, your end goal is and how you're going to build into that how you're going to achieve it there's nothing worse than greenwashing we'll be mentioning that in other workshops as well we want to totally avoid you declaring that you're going to achieve something without any uh, evidence of how you're going to work out how to achieve that as well so we'll be totally avoiding the greenwash uh, part of that yeah and i think that's yeah as part of my invention that's the really important bit about this is it's it's really great to measure our emissions, but it's really important that that comes with uh, a next steps um, mm. phase, which yeah, we can look at. And actually, I think often once you've measured your emissions, you've kind of done, well, in theory, you've done the hard part because potentially there are things like Paul mentioned that actually are going to be quite easy to change and have lots of wider benefits. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily have picked them up without measuring the emissions in the first place. So hopefully that's something that as we go through, we'll notice that and we can kind of discuss that as we go forward. Yeah, very much. Um, so yeah, so the people that have replied, it looks like actually measuring emissions hasn't been done before, which I mean makes sense um, to, given attending this workshop series, if it's not something people have achieved. So that's, yeah, that's good. And we can kind of learn through that process together. Um, as Paul mentioned, we're gonna, in order to measure our emissions next session, there's a number of things we need. So I'll mention them now. And then Paul and Martin, if you think of anything, I forgot to list them, please shout out. We, we'll also sure. put this in an email. Um, so don't worry about if you don't get it all down now, I'll make sure we follow up and you've got the information for the next session. Um, ideally, if you have like a laptop or tablet, something that you can kind of do the calculations on and store the data, that'd be really useful. Um, we then need an array of bills so ideally kind of bills from the last 12 months, either kind of gas and oil bills, depending on what you're using, the mileage of your company vehicles. So not necessarily, well, not the ones that people are using to commute, but the ones that are kind of owned by the company and are used um, for business travel that way. Um, your electricity bill. And then depends on how it was laid out, but kind of an example bill that will show what tariff you're on. So, for example, if you're on a green tariff, obviously um, that's all from renewables. So your emissions from that will be quite small or nothing. But it's important to we need that information to then be able to work the emissions from that. Yeah, the only thing I was going to add, Beth, was it's, we need 12 months worth of yes, uh, yes, sort of information sorry, yes. because to do your footprint, we're going to need to take a, a snapshot of the year. Um, and it's, it's up to you, really, is whether you... you produce all the bills or you just bring in one example bill and then your total usage for the year 
Um, some companies may just get it from their electricity meter readings. Um, it's, however, it's the easiest way for you to, to get the data, really. And if you struggle, then obviously come back to me or Beth. Yeah, let us know if there's something you're struggling with or need a bit more information about, and we can see what we can do. That just one. want to pick up on one point that uh, Karen Alderman said. She actually set her baseline during COVID. So some companies that I work with have actually asked them to look at their pre-COVID year as a standard operating manufacturing year, because what we want to do is show an improvement on that year. It's a COVID year is not a standard year for you. Your carbon footprint is only going to go in one direction, and that's going to be up. And that is not going to actually give you any, any of your staff or any of you encouragement of improving your carbon footprint because it's all going to be negative. Uh, and no matter all the work you do will only have a positive impact to your carbon. If you look at your pre-COVID carbon footprint, historic data, if you've got access to that, if you've been here long enough, you're only putting, you can get access. The half hour data reading is even better as a gold mine of information. If you can access that, you can then compare that to your COVID year and even your now 2022 financial year as well. And you can actually see their marked improvements. You'll also be able to see what the COVID year impact had on your business to your 18, 19 or 19, 20, depending on how your year fell. If you've got access to pre-COVID data, I would, I would recommend do that if, that if you feel that would be more useful to your type of industry. There's only one other thing that I think it might only affect one company. And I see there's an ice cream company uh, on the call, if you use, if you're a high user of refrigerative gases, big refrigeration storage, anything like that, not necessarily just air conditioning units. If they if they just kind of read gas as kind of a service element, if it's not recorded in that service data, of actually knowing how much gas has been re regassed into a refrigeration system, that's also a fuel that you've used that's got a carbon footprint that's part of your scope one. So if that affects your business we need uh, to include that as well as your scope one. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that, Martin. Um, so does anyone have any questions about that? Um, that they want answered now, or we can, like I said, you, we will put it into an email and you can get back to us that way if there's anything. I see Steve's got a call, a uh, question in the chat room and I think Paul and I are sort of partly uh, answering that. Uh, Steve's asked, can we look at what a difference of a product uh, carbon footprint would be? Uh, again, yeah. it's usually Paul's there, so I'm going to hand over to his security knowledge uh, into this in a minute. For, for me, when I've looked at product ones and we've looked at kind of Sony's carbon footprint, we start with their built environment, so their manufacturing process, the building and everything, what that footprint is. If it's a fairly relatively simple um, production line, so you're producing x tubs of ice cream or so many different units of process and it's pretty much a standard item you're producing that can literally be divided your your built environment carbon footprint can be divided by the number of units you manufacture in that year of course you also have to include as paul said the supplied data of the materials their air miles and things that the, the footprint of getting the um, ingredients or content or components of what you're manufacturing to your factory, delivery to your factory and delivery from your factory's footprints. But that's as far as my expertise on product knowledge goes. I'm going to pass over to Paul if he wants to add anything else to that. Yeah, I'd well, say so that's pretty good of mine, to be honest. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Product carbon footprinting is, is quite a complex area. Um, and so long as you've got the information, um, and it's really around with mine, quite um, correct me, sort of covered really the content of the goods so what is making up your product how it's made where it's made and where it's shipped um, but i've messaged um steve just to, to just sort of like um, pick, pick my brains offline and we'll see what we can do i'm currently doing one life cycle analysis um, with another client at the moment and their product is really interesting it's a cutting product that is made and then resharpened 25 30 times in its life so we're now looking at the carbon footprint of a resharpenable blade versus a single disposable one. So, but that's fairly simple. It's a bit of steel. Um, we, it goes through three machines, so we can we can work out the energy content quite quickly. But uh, yeah, I'll pick it up with Steve offline, and then we'll, we'll see if we can help. Thanks, Paul. Beth, there was some questions early on about um, slides and contact information. So I guess you will yes. share the PDFs. 
Um, yeah, I'm happy to share the slides um, and, and we can share the information, I guess, with Paul and Martin um, and myself and Chris, you can get in contact with any of us if you need kind of details before um, the next sessions. Um, let me just look for the questions. Yeah, and we'll then also include all the information, what, what's needed for the next session, where it is, where you need to be at what time, um, just so that it's hopefully quite easy to find us. Um, yeah, and just feel free to, yeah, get, please get in contact beforehand if there is anything you kind of need clarifying, because um, obviously once it's in person, we're aware that it's a bit harder to potentially find that information if you need to kind of dig through or ask people. So um, just kind of let us know if there's anything that comes up. Um, there's one new one on the chat, um, Beth yes. from Andrew, around estimating or working out carbon foot impact from conferences. And I'm sure I've, I've got some um, bit of either a web link or something useful for that. So I'll, uh, I'll need to have a look at that and then feed it back to Andrew. Yeah, yeah, we can look into that and then try to come up, find something that might be useful to feed back in the next session. Yeah, because I obviously... Uh, depending on people's business, it's going to range a lot where their impacts come from. So we'll kind of try and kind of cover that and use everyone's expertise in the next session and come go through that in a bit more detail if we need to. Here's a question from Becky. Can we use numbers of litres of fuel purchase to calculate fleet emissions? Uh, yes, you can. You, you might have um, a, a matrix of, of how much your staff use their vehicles as private mileage or business mileage. But as Paul said, the, the, the more accurate data is your business mileage. You've got access to that. Having the fuel uh, volume is useful rather than the price uh, because the, the way the prices are, are varying on all of the uh, utilities and all of the fuel costs, litres is always better in oil, gas and, and fuels than the, than the prices but yes you can use uh, liters if you haven't got access to the mileage data and if you've got a standard rate of 10 percent of the, their mileage uses private or business so. um, okay perfect thank you martin um has anyone else got any final comments or anything they want to say or if not we'll let you go and then hopefully yes yeah, we'll look forward to seeing you in person um It'd be really nice to actually meet everyone and we can kind of work together and it'd be nice to kind of actually be able to have some conversations and see see how it goes when we're measuring missions and kind of compare where everyone else's emissions come from in comparison to our own. Um, and then, yeah, look at how we reduce that, which will be exciting. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for your time today, everyone. Um, and, yeah, we'll hopefully see you in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Great, okay, good luck with well. getting all of the data. Yeah. yeah, don't be put off with that. Utility companies are notorious for being very slow at responding to getting you any data that you want to go into more depth, particularly half-hour data readings. Keep nagging them, keep on them. It is the hardest first step, but once you've got that data, it is invaluable. We can do so much with that data. So please be very patient. Keep on some literally uh, every few days. I appreciate we've only got a couple of weeks before we want to try and capture the data. If you've got online access to data, brilliant. Uh, but if you haven't, then yeah, good luck with nagging them to death. Good luck, everyone. Okay, thanks, everybody. See you in a few weeks. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. In a few weeks. <laughs>